Hello and welcome back to Crit and Crit. I'm Sint. I'm Axiom. And we are continuing our discussion of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix while we play through Final Fantasy V. So continuing from our discussion last episode with degrees of malice and evil, what we're going to be looking at today still touches quite heavily on this umbrage. Um, what do you do when authority is compromised? I am having bad luck with dodging these guys. So, as we are set in a school, one of the things people always tell their kids when they go off to school is, if something is wrong, tell a teacher, tell an adult, get someone who can help. But, through basically the entire story, the problem at the school is an adult, is a teacher, is an authority figure one who keeps finding more and more ways to gain further authority through the influence of an outside actor. So, if you are a student at Hogwarts, and you can see things are not good, there is clear tension, something is very, very wrong here, and you now know that the authority figures you have always been told to take your concerns to are not trustworthy, or if they are trustworthy, have their hands tied and are ineffective. What do you do? Well, under normal circumstances, you go up the chain, but... For obvious reasons, that's not really an option in this case. Oh. Yep, because, well, up the chain is kind of where the problem lies. For this specific situation, you'd probably say up the chain would be Dumbledore, who's usually out of the school or busy and inaccessible. But in this case, if you go to Dumbledore, he's the reason up is there. Fudge has her basically spying on the school and reporting to him about any things that Dumbledore might be up to. She is there because Fudge thinks Dumbledore is trying to lead a coup against him. Which, we'll get to Fudge in a second, but Fudge is also going to be an example of compromised authority, even though he's not actively attempting to do so out of malice the same way that Umbridge is. But this is when a lot of the students you see kind of start falling into more camps on falling onto different sides of the debate of when are things to be obeyed and when is it appropriate to disregard? When is authority meant to be respected when it's not the bastion of respectability and uh, authenticity that you've always been told it was? Because, well, most of the students do not stop being respectful to the other teachers just because Umbridge proves terrible at the job. Their ire is reserved for the teachers they always have been. So, you know, things don't usually change. Until Umbridge starts escalating things, and then it's basically just everybody who already hates Umbridge focusing their efforts on getting even with her, or doing what they can to resist. Which brings up two terms here. Civil disobedience and malicious compliance. Two of my favorite things to hear about. Oh boy. Sorry. There is... there are fewer entertaining stories of things happening in rough situations that just give you that pleasing sense of someone got what they deserved than malicious Catharsis. compliance. Catharsis, thank you. Yeah. So, civil disobedience, by definition, is... I see the law, or the rule, I understand it, I think it is morally wrong or disagreeable, 
I am not going to follow it, and I'm going to make a show of it. I will accept whatever consequences come my way. I think in the U.S. this is best known through studying uh, civil rights movements, specifically the uh, stuff done with uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, breaking through segregated lines, uh, going into places that the law said they shouldn't be, even though it made no sense, and the laws really were dumb and needed to be broken there. Uh, the bus boycotts, so on and so forth. King was arrested. We know this because letters from Birmingham jail. So, accept the consequences of standing up for, to an unjust authority figure. But in doing so, draw attention to how unjust the situation is and sway public opinion. Harry does this pretty well. He doesn't go very far through Defense Against the Dark Hearts without getting repeated detentions with Umbridge. And as mentioned before, permanently scars his hand as a result. But he does not back down basically until McGonagall yells at him about, you need to stop this, or she's going to go after you even harder. But he does make it very visible that he is not taking this lying down, he's not going to stop telling the truth, and he's not going to let her lie to everybody like this. Malicious compliance, on the other hand, is, I understand the instruction, and I'm going to do exactly what the instruction says, no more, no less, and as far away from the spirit of the instruction as I can possibly get. I want you to cut your I want you to cut your hair. Alright, I will cut a single strand of hair. You watched me do it. I did what you told me. I'm going to move on now. Oh, that's not what you wanted me to do? Well, you should have been more clear in your instructions. I didn't want to, you know, overstep my bounds. Alternatively, is, there's doing the same thing, but going to the opposite extreme. You want me to cut my hair? I'll cut it all off. Now I'm bald. Yeah. We see this basically in multiple ways. This one, I think, is a lot more visible than the civil disobedience. Um, where when Dumbledore leaves and the twins leave, the teachers decide, oh... Oh, yeah, I can't help you with that, Umbridge. You're going to have to take care of that yourself because, uh, I don't know if I have the authority to take care of this. Even though it is explicitly pointed out that any one of the other teachers could have effortlessly taken care of most of the disruptions. But none of them like her. So why would they bother? And if she complains, they're just like, well, you've made it clear that you will punish anybody who oversteps their perceived authority, so uh, we don't want to get on your bad side. We're sorry that you have so much to do. If only this could have been avoided somehow. Yep. And we also see this with uh, the interview with the Quibbler. The Daily Prophet can't print anything about Harry's side of the story. That's been made very clear by Fudge. The Quibbler does not have any association with the Daily Prophet, so they're not bound to that. And you never made Harry agree to not give interviews like this. So, tell my story to this newspaper, well, to this magazine. And therefore, at least some people will hear my side of things. There's no rule against it. So, Seems perfectly yeah. reasonable to me. Yep. Finding and, uh, little rebellions under the weight of a, of a corrupted authority who is no longer trustworthy or willing to look out for the people it's meant to defend. And we see how Umbridge's only response to this is to make more rules. She doesn't understand or doesn't comprehend a way to deal with this problem. People are following the rules, but they're following them in a way she doesn't like, and her only solution is to make more rules to try and make their civil disobedience, or their malicious compliance, rather, into something that breaks the rules. And fortunately for the protagonists, unfortunately for Umbridge. Uh, she's not particularly clever. 
and thus she never figures out a way to be a step ahead of the students when they're pulling this and yep. you know for fudge or not fudge uh, filch who's yep. I'm helping her out solely out of a sense of his own malicious joy yep. ironically the way she handled the quibble article was the exact opposite of what she should have done as hermione points out the fastest way to guarantee everybody in the school reads the reads the article is to ban it if she had ignored it no one took the quibbler seriously yep Hermione repeatedly made snide comments about it in front of Luna, whose dad owns it. It would have just been a few people out in the real world got a hold of it and had their minds changed. But almost no Hogwarts students would have laid eyes on it until Umbridge said, you can't. And then they said, oh, really? This is something the real world refers to as the Streisand effect, which is named after the, uh, I think she was an actress at one point, and Hollywood Still personality. Is, I think. She is okay. Hollywood personality Barbara Streisand, where she did something I don't remember what, and then wanted to have the attention taken off of it, and her attempts to remove it from the social awareness only brought more attention to it. Okay, I actually didn't know a little bit more about this. She actually didn't do anything. There was like a landscape survey that had been taking pictures of the area, and one of them happened to include her house. She did not want her house having pictures taken of it without, you know, permission and stuff, so she asked, so she was trying to get that, you know, taken off so people wouldn't look at her stuff. But the more she said, don't look at it, don't look at it, everybody wanted to see it. Because, you know, that's gotcha. human nature. Yeah, I wasn't super familiar with the specific incident, even if I did know that it was the source of the of the terminology. This also has happened... This has been a thing that's happened a lot. Oh, yeah. The most... The most the one I want to remember the most is the... Uh... Beyonce Super Bowl pictures. Yes, that was that was what I was about to mention. Was the pictures of Beyonce at the Super Bowl that uh, were taken at positions and mid motion moments that were not particularly flattering, and her publicists kept trying to get them off the internet. And well, the internet was one. On the internet. <laughs> yep, pretty much. <laughs> But yeah, so further along the line of corrupt authority, we look at Minister of Magic Cornelius Fudge, who is, for all intents and purposes, the end-all be-all of wizarding law and society. His word goes. Even if you disagree with him, he is in that position. I'm not sure if he's elected or appointed. It's not made explicitly clear. They've mentioned people being in the running for something, but presumably since our protagonists are too young to be involved in politics to that degree, it's not super important to them. Um, I'd imagine if it's just a mirror to Wizarding Britain that it's probably an elected position, like uh, Prime Minister. Well, in the sense of you vote for the party and whoever is in charge of the party takes over. Right. Uh, but Fudge is very, very concerned with his image. He does not want to have to deliver bad news because it would hurt his political career. To that end, he spends basically the entire summer doing everything he can to discredit Harry's story about Voldemort coming back, and also discrediting Dumbledore, who sided with Harry against Fudge. As soon as you become, as we've mentioned before, politically inconvenient, you, become, you are an obstacle and must be taken out of the way. The fact that Voldemort is back and poses an existential threat to a good majority of the country's population. But it would make Fudge look bad to be the one who said that. So he doesn't want to say it. You know, even though he could be remembered as the guy who sounded the warning bell before it was too late and saved thousands if not more lives. But nope, don't want to don't want to hurt his uh, 
He's looking and he's looking too short term, basically. This is something that could, if he was taking a long term approach, be very advantageous to him, but it would require him taking a short term loss, for lack of a better way to put it. Yep. And we see this play out in many, many different ways. The lockdown on free speech and the Daily Prophet. The uh, last-minute moving of hearing schedules without properly notifying the people involved. Like, it was pure chance that Harry was able to get to the hearing on time, because they moved it the day of. Yep, and with no notice, and he only really found his way there because Mr. Weasley happened to have an idea of why they, where they might be. Yep. So, extrapolate on that. How many other people could Fudge be doing this to? And think about how the court systems generally, you know, don't really favor the defendant, for lack of a better way to put it. If Harry hadn't shown up to that trial, he probably would have just expelled, no questions asked. And I, and I got the impression that they moved it because they didn't want Dumbledore showing up. And he did anyway, because it's Dumbledore and he's with Dumbledore. Yep. But, um, let's see. Appointing an inept instructor as a spy at the school with the intent of disrupting the education so that the students would not be able to be turned against the minister. The higher up you get in the hierarchy, the more dangerous it is when the authority figure becomes compromised and their fallibility can no longer be ignored. It's obviously too much to ask that people be infallible because, obviously, they're people. They're only human. Unless they're having in which case they're having. You know where I'm going with this, but... We're not asking the characters to be perfect. That would be unrealistic. But, the more responsibility given to you, the closer you have to watch yourself to make sure that you are using it in a good and effective way to protect the people in, um, over whom you've been placed in charge. Fudge doesn't do that. Fudge likes donations. Fudge likes feeling special. Fudge likes social events. Fudge likes being popular and famous. He has lost sight of why he was appointed, and therefore, at the end of the story, we see that he drops the ball when he has irrefutable proof that the Death Eaters have invaded, Voldemort is back, and he spent the past year denying it publicly. The political career he worked so hard to protect falls apart as soon as the truth is right in front of his eyes and he can't find a way to weasel out of it. So, makes you wonder how things are going to go from there, and if things will get any better with regard to the politics of the Wizard of England. So, anything else to add, or you think that's about it? I think that about settles it for this one. Alright, in that case, later! Oh, hey. Oh, I guess we'll get that another time. See ya.